اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی عمری وحل لقطت من لسانی یفقہو قولی We start with verse 19 of Surah Hajj. It says, These are the two opponents who dispute with each other about their rub. As for the disbeliever, disbelievers, garments of fire will be cut out for them. Boiling water will be poured over their heads. Now this verse with its uh, general words deals with two sets of people, namely the Muslims and the Kafirs, the non-believers. Whether they belong to the earliest of times or uh, they belong to the later times. Now, as we know that the people who believed in Allah and the message of their uh, respective prophets were all called what? Muslims. However, the particular event in the background of which it was revealed about uh, two groups of men who faced each other in combat on the battle of uh, battleground of badr hazrat ali hazrat uh, ubeda razi allah taala anhum ajmain stepped out of the muslim ranks whereas utba bin rabi and his son walid and his brother shiba came out to challenge them in the fight the three unbelievers were slain and hazrat ali and hazrat hamza emerged unscratched while hazrat ubeda رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ واز بیڈلی وونڈیڈ اینڈ ایکسپائرڈ ایٹ دا فیٹ آف پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم دا ریولیشن آف دس ورس ان ریلیشن ٹو دیز واریئرس آف دا فیلڈ آف بدر از ویل اسٹیبلشڈ آن دا اتھارٹی آف ٹریڈیشنس کنٹینڈ ان بخاری اینڈ مسلم بٹ اٹ از ایویڈنٹ دیٹ اٹس میسج از ناٹ ایکسکلوسو فار دیم الون بٹ اٹ امبریسز دا انٹائر مسلم کمیونٹی آف آل ٹائمس اللہ سیز that as far as the non-believers are concerned, garments of fire have been cut and prepared for them. And what else? That in Jahannam, boiling water will be poured over their heads. Why on the heads? Because this head refused to do sajda. And the next verse further explains their condition that That is verse 20, which will not only melt their skins, but also the inner parts of their bellies. So this is how the hot water poured on the heads is going to affect the rest of their bodies. Verse 21, and there will be hooked rods of iron to lash them. Verse 22, whenever in their anguish they try to escape therefrom, they will be forced back therein and will be told, taste the punishment of the burning fire. Verse 23, as for those who have faith and do good deeds, Allah will certainly admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow. They shall be decked with pearls and bracelets of gold and their garments will be silk. Now the verse says that all the people who did good deeds, good deeds along with faith in Allah, along with other rewards, will be rewarded with silk clothes and gold bracelets. And these bracelets will be studded with beautiful stones. This is to show that they will be honored like the kings and chiefs who used to wear these things. Men are not allowed to wear gold or silk in dunya, but they will be allowed in Jannah. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar Razi Allah Ta'ala said that once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the clothes of the people living in paradise will be made from silk, which will be extracted from a fruit growing there. There is also a statement by Hazrat Jabir that there would be a tree in paradise which would produce silk and the people of paradise would wear dresses made from it. Then Hazrat Abu Huraira reports that Prophet said, He who wears silk in this world will not wear in the hereafter. He who drinks wine in this world will be deprived of the sacred nectar in the hereafter. He who uses utensils made of precious metals for food and drink in this world will be denied their use in the hereafter. 
Then the Prophet ﷺ added, three things are exclusively for the people of paradise. Then another hadith narrated by Hazrat Abu Saad al-Khudri says, He who wore silk in the world will not wear it in the hereafter, even if he is admitted to paradise. All other people of paradise will wear silk, but not he. <clears throat> Verse 24, this is because during their life on earth, they were guided to accept the pure words of Allah and they were shown the way of all the praiseworthy. <clears throat> now the verse says that this reward was given to them because in dunya they were guided towards ila tayyabi min al -kawl. And which people are guided towards it? The one who seek it. The ones who are attracted towards it. Now, according to Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas, Razi Allah Ta'ala Anho, At-Tayyibi Min Al-Qawl means the Kalimai Tayyiba, La Ilaha Illallah. Which some commentators say that this means the Quran. And as a matter of fact, both of these are included in it. And the ones who walk on this path is led to Al-Hamid, the praise, praiseworthy. Now, one may notice that out of the 99 names of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, why this name Al-Hamid is used. This is an indication that this path leads to paradise because we know that the people of paradise are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every breath. Verse 25, as for those who are unbelievers and debar others from the way of Allah and from the Masjid al-Haram to which we have assigned all mankind with equal rights, whether they are natives or foreigners, and whoever intend to deviate from righteousness to wrongdoing in its vicinity, we will make him taste a painful punishment. Now, in this verse, Inna lazina kafaru are the non-believers of Makkah. What did they do? Stopped people from the way of Allah. Now, we have heard how these people stopped any outsider who came to Makkah, even before he entered. And they used to warn him that there is a magician, Na'uzubillah, by the name of Muhammad, and he, spell, uh, he casts a spell and he spellbounds people by his speech. So don't go near him. Otherwise, you too will get hypnotized. Tufail bin Amir says that when he went to Makkah and he was doing tawaf and someone told him during that time that there is a man who bewitches people and he pointed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says that I got so scared that at that when I used to pass by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the tawaf, I used to put my fingers in my ears so that I may not listen to what he has to say. And people were that scared. So one way of preventing people from the path of Allah is that you present such a negative false image of those who convey Allah's deen that people run away from deen altogether. Then these people of Makkah made a social boycott with the Muslims. This too was a scheme to stop people from coming to Islam. Then when in the 6th Hijri, the Muslims came from Medina to perform Umrah, the non-believers did not let them enter Makkah and perform Umrah. Although the Muslims were wearing their ihrams and they had to return from Hudaybiyah. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that no one has a right to stop a Muslim from entering Masjid al-Haram. Everyone has equal rights, whether a local or a foreigner. What rights are these? The rights of worship, that is doing tawaf, reading salah or Quran or any other kind of ibadah. There is a hadith of Prophet ﷺ in which he said, O children of Abd Munaf, those of you who will have authority over the affairs of the people should not stop anybody from moving round the Kaaba or from offering prayers in it at any time of the day or night. It is because of this instruction of Prophet ﷺ that the doors of the Masjid al-Ahram are always open 24 hours a day. 
people are going in and out all day all night to perform umrah tawaf or other ibadah now one thing has to be clarified that a huge number of people are there in the haram most of the time and for its effective regulation and management there are certain principles like there's a, a specified area for women and then men and the management can tell someone to go in their respective area or when a certain area has to be cleaned they put chains around it so that no one can enter so these things which are for the sake of management purposes does not come under the command of this verse and we find that masjid nabawi in madina is closed after 10 at night till tahajjud because there is no such instruction for that uh, masjid now there is a difference of opinion amongst the commentators on the terms al masjid al haram according to some it is the second uh, uh, so, sorry according to some it is the uh, sacred mosque of kaaba and some say that it is the entire haram of makka but the first opinion seems more appropriate because the word masjid is used with it however the entire muslim umma and all the jurists are unanimous on the fact that all those areas of makka and the haram where the essential rituals of the pilgrimage are performed such as the space between safa and marwa the uh, areas of mina arafat muzdalfa are uh, waqf that means that for the benefit of the entire muslim umma and have never been nor can be owned by individuals the end of the verse says that whoever does ilhad what is ilhad a deviation from what is right within the perimeters of uh, sorry within the premises of uh, haram will be punished by allah subhanahu wa taala with a severe punishment so in other words ilhad is a sin it needs to be clarified that all things forbidden by the religious code and forbidden uh, everywhere and will attract punishment uh, wherever committed and the specific reference to haram in this verse is the emphasis of the fact that just as a good deed performed within the limits of the haram will be generously rewarded similarly a sin committed there will attract the most severe punishment then we come to verse 26 remember we identified the site of the sacred house of ibrahim saying worship none besides me sanctify my house for those worshippers who make tawaf and stand in prayer bow and prostrate themselves now why is ibrahim alayhi salam mentioned all of a sudden because when allah subhanahu wa taala asked him to submit he said i submit no delaying no excuses now ibrahim alayhi salam belonged to iraq and when he um, migrated he went to syria and egypt all these areas were well populated and their roots were firm in shirk but makka was a place totally barren and unpopulated unpo- uh, and allah wished that he should be given a new environment where the future generations should be free from shirk for that purpose allah subhanahu wa taala brought ibrahim alayhi salam hundreds of miles away in the valley of makka and he constructed the house of allah and the foundations of this house had been laid first by the angels and then by adam alayhi salam and then allah commanded ibrahim alayhi salam that keep my house clean clean from shirk and also special attention should be paid to its external cleanliness and purity for whom for people who come there to perform hajj umrah and other ibadah verse 27 and make a proclamation of hajj to mankind they will come to you on foot and on lean camels from every distant quarter so the next command given to ibrahim alayhi salam was to make an announcement for hajj hazrat abdullah bin abbas razi allah ta'ala anhu says that when ibrahim alayhi salam was commanded by allah to make this um, proclamation he submitted that the place where he stood was an inhabited desolate place with no one to hear 
and the proclamations whereas he uh, lacked the means to convey it to the populated areas so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then told him that he was required only to make the proclamation and the responsibility of uh, conveying it to the four corners of the world rested with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself Thereupon Ibrahim alayhi salam stood at Makkah e Ibrahim and made the proclamation and Allah Taala magnified his voice so that it was heard all around the earth It is also related that he made the proclamation from the top of the mount of Abu Khubais and he put his fingers in his ears turned his face in four directions and called out O people Allah has established his house and made it obligatory upon you to make pilgrimage to it so obey the command of your lord it is also mentioned in the narration that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so decreed that the announcement was heard uh, miraculously all over the world not only by the living people then but also those yet to be born up to the day of resurrection and all those who are destined to perform the pilgrimage Uh, responded to the call with the words labbaik allahumma labbaik and hazrat ibn abbas razi allah taala no says that the talbiya during the pilgrimage has its origin in this response to the call of ibrahim alayhi salam and then allah says that don't worry people will come here from every corner on foot on transport meaning that from near and far places both and we can see this promise of allah subhanahu wa taala come true with our own eyes that so many people come there all round the year that uh, boarding and lodging <clears throat> sometimes becomes a problem and the magnificence of this aya can only be um, felt if you have gone for hajj or umrah you see that vast ocean of humanity all calling out labbaik allahumma labbaik oh allah here i am ready to serve you ready to worship you now according to jeffrey lion he comes up with a beautiful point that when ibrahim alayhi salam was uh, commanded to make this call uh, there was no one uh, except his own immediate family but he obeyed allah and made the call if you and i were there we would have said why should we make this call what's the use but such was ibrahim alayhi salam's love and trust for allah that he obeyed and look at the response to his call imagine the call which he made and then look at the response we see people coming from every nook and corner of the world europeans americans asians all crying labbaik allahumma labbaik subhanallah Now the verse says, "Yatina min kulle fajin amik." They will come from every deep distance, Ravine. If you get a chance to stand on the roof of the Haram and witness this ocean of humanity coming, this ayah will, you know, start coming to your mind immediately. Verse twenty eight, so that they may witness the benefits which are made available for them, and pronounce the name of Allah over the cattle which we have provided as food for them on the appointed days. Then eat meat themselves and feed the indigent and needy. Now, why people should come to this place to see the benefits? What benefits are these? From the religious point of view, they see these reminders of Allah. signs of allah they worship him they get reward and maghfira in return and from the worldly point of view people get a chance to see people of different nationalities different kinds of trades businesses and then the spiritual benefit that you get such a satisfaction of the heart and soul which cannot be experienced anywhere in the world when the house of allah is in front of your eyes nothing else in the world has got value for you then the verse says that mention allah's name over the cattle this means uh that allah's name should be recited at the time the cattle is slaughtered to show that the muslims are to slaughter and sacrifice animals in allah's name alone 
so as to uh, distinguish them from the disbelievers who slaughter animals without mentioning Allah's name or by mentioning other names than Allah. In Ayamin Maluma, these days are 10th of Zilhaj and the three days that follow. One can eat from this meat and give the give it to the needy as well. Like we do with our uh, Qurbani, that we keep some for ourselves, some for the relatives and some for the needy. Keeping for yourself is not obligatory, but it is good if you eat from it. Verse 29, then they sh- showed, uh, sorry, then they should accomplish uh, their need for acts of shaving or cutting their hair and taking a bath, fulfill their woes and go for tawaf e ziyara to the ancient house. Now this verse refers, uh, this is verse 29, it refers to uh, uh, the rituals of Hajj. So the rituals of Hajj and in this the word Tafasa, tafasa hum means that that dirt which gathers on human body. While a person is in the state of Ephraim, he cannot shave, he cannot trim or pluck his uh, hair, nor can he uh, cut his nails. Uh, he cannot use perfume and it is quite natural that dirt should collect under his hair and nails uh, or on his bo- other parts of the body. Now, after the pilgrims have performed the sacrifice, they should remove this dirt, meaning that they should now remove ihram, wear normal clothes, shave their heads and cut their nails. And this verse mentions sacrifice first and then refers to the removal of dirt, which suggests that these two acts must be performed in that order. It is forbidden to shave one's head or pair nails before the obligatory sacrifice. Anyone who does so must slaughter an animal as dam. What is dam? That is the expiation that you give for a sin. Now, the observance of the various functions of Hajj in the same order in which they are mentioned in the Quran and Hadith must be followed. And any alteration in the sequence of these rituals makes a sacrifice of an animal obligatory. Then the verse says that... Fulfill the woes. Fulfill the woes. Now, Nuzur is the plural of Nazar. Nuzura. Nuzura or uh, this is the plural of Nazar which means a woe. When a person commits himself verbally to do an act in order to win the goodwill of Allah, which is not otherwise obligatory on him, it becomes a nazar and its performance becomes obligatory for him. And by consensus of ummah, uh, provided that this act is not sinful or forbidden. So one point has to be made clear that a resolve made in one's heart to do something does not come under this nazar. It does not become a nazar unless it is pronounced with the tongue. Now, one may wonder why between the rituals of Hajj, this instruction of fulfilling woes has been inserted in, while the rules governing woes have an independent status, which are to be fulfilled at all times and at every place, and not just uh, during Hajj. A possible explanation for this is that when a person sets out with the intention of performing Hajj, his heart prompts him to do the maximum number of good deeds. And he makes many woes, like for example, that I would give this much sadaka, or I'll pay so many nawafil during this period. So now these woes must be fulfilled. If any woe has been made, it should be uh, fulfilled. And then what next? That go for tawaf e ziyara. This tawaf is performed on the tenth of Zilhaj after casting stones and making sacrifice. This tawaf is second, is the second obligatory ritual of Hajj. The first being wakuf e arafat, which is performed earlier. Now, after this tawaf, the state of ihram is fully terminated and all restrictions are removed. The word used for the khana e kaaba is baitul atik. This word atik is very meaningful here. Now, one meaning of atik is ancient 
And one meaning is that it is free, no one owns it. And one meaning is respectable, which means muazzaz. So all these meanings fit in the description of this house. It is ancient, it is muazzaz, it is respectable, and no one owns it other than Allah. Verse 30, this was the object for which the Kaaba was built. And whoever honors the sacred rites of Allah, it is good for him in the sight of his Rabb. The meat of cattle is lawful to you. Therefore, shun the abom abomination of idols and shun all false statements. Now, the verse means that people who abide by the restrictions laid during Hajj, it is good for their own selves because they are people who do not care about any restrictions and behave the way they want to. Allah says that if you follow the restrictions in the true sense, then it is good for your own self. Why? Because then there are more chances that your Hajj will be accepted. Like, you know, when I, I myself went for Hajj in that group, there was a man who, you know, he kept wearing a thick gold chain in his Hajj days while wearing ihram. And wearing gold for men is haram anyways, but wearing it, it, it in those days is all the more sinful. And uh, I tried to explain to his wife that she should tell him to take it off. And she said that, no, he's never going to take it, for, take it off because he says that I'm, you know, just used to wearing it. Then after this, Allah says that lawful animals, which are all time lawful, they are halal for you, even in the state of Iram. Why is this being said? Because there are certain things which are halal otherwise and unlawful in the state of Iram. And the animals which are unlawful at all times are unlawful in Iram too. The detail of these animals have been given in other verses, such as the swine, uh, one which is beaten to death, or slaughtered without reciting the name of Allah or in the name of someone else other than Allah, etc. Then the verse says that shun from the filth of the idols. Now the word rijs means filth or moral impurity. And the idols have been described as filth because they fill a man's heart and soul with moral impurity. And right after that, the command comes that refrain from false statement. Now we see that here... Uh, Lie has been equated with shirk. We condemn shirk, but we have made lying halal for us. Lies run in our society like blood runs in our bodies. Whether it is personal relationships, trades, businesses, lying is the name of the game. The Prophet ﷺ said, Among the major sins are associating anyone with Allah disobedience of one's parents, giving false evidence and telling a lie in general talk. And the narrator says that while saying Prophet wasallam was in a, what you call a um, reclining position. But when he said the last bit about lies, he sat up straight and he kept on repeating it so many times that they say that we wish that he would stop saying it. So this shows how crucial it is not to lie. See, when somebody is lying and he sits up suddenly, when is that? When, when there is something very important and you want to convey it, you just sit up and tell the other person. Otherwise, if you are... Uh, kind of, you know, relaxed, you will just say it while lying down. He, he, you know, he came in a sitting position and the second point that he kept on repeating it. So we see in this hadith that the stress which Prophet Sallallahu laid on not telling lies was not even laid on shirk. I think the time is up now. Wa akhirid dawana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.